Okay, we come to part B, transform method. That's the CD for, for this, this chapter I'm going to produce. Before that, I want to make an announcement for you. We have done, I, we have already produced CD for chapter 1, chapter 2, in part A, 6 and 4, 6. The CD which we are going to produce is part B, transform, chapter 1, transform method. These are the three chapters that you need to know for your B4 exam on the March the 20th, which is a Monday, 8 to 9, 15 a.m. in Rex Wells Theatre. For that particular exam, all you need to know is chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 1 here, plus the tutorial that you have, plus the tutorial, plus the tutorial. Tutorial solutions for these two have been released on the web for you. So you can look at them. We will release the tutorial solution for this next week for you. So if you prepare all these, you should be ready then for the exam on Monday, 20th of March. That's week four. Just an announcement. Make sure that you... you you, you, you note of the date. If there's any problem or anything, if you're not sure about something, please come and talk to me. In transform method, what are we going to do? Basically, we're going to learn about introduction to the transform. That's our basic uh, transform we need to learn first. Similar to Laplace transform that you have learned, this is introduction to the transform. First, we'll talk about what is the transform. Then we talk about its properties, not all the properties, but the properties relevant to us is just in thing. Then we talk about inverse Laplace transform, and then we will learn about frequency response estimation, how we estimate frequency response, pole zero description, and we look at one second order system. And then you have to do the tutorial, or what we call the problem sheets here. Yeah? To introduce a transform, there's two things that you need to look at. First is continuous time domain. So the signal, continuous time domain is xt, and if you replace t by nt, you can display time domain signal, which is xf. As you all know that if you take Laplace transform, you get xs for a continuous time. Similarly, if you do subtransform, you get XS for a discrete signal. Then from Laplace transform, you substitute S equal to J omega, you then get a transfer function and it's a, um, as a function of omega. Similarly here, if you substitute that equal to E to the J theta, you get X E to the J theta. From now onwards, instead of writing it E to the J theta, we will write as X theta, which is which is same as x to the a theta, which will be same kind of representation, x omega, x theta. Theta is the digital frequency, remember? Theta is equal to omega a t, which is 2 pi f a over f s. So theta is less than or equal to pi, less than or equal to minus pi. Theta is known as the digital frequency. Once you have x s or x omega, then you look at the S-plane, and you will find that all the poles, and which we'll come back to in a minute, the st stable region is on the left-hand side for S-plane. And if you think of, if you take these two edges and bend them, they become kind of a circle, and you find when in set transform, after you translate Analog of the digital domain, you find S plane, the set plane transformation is all these dots are inside a unit circle. And this region is the stable region, we call it, and this is the stable region. And you then find that this position is, we call theta equal to zero, and we come along this way as theta equal to pi. And this is theta equal to zero, and this is theta equal to minus pi. And we can show that this boundary 
this bound circle is given by the equation mod that equal to 1. That means the radius is equal to 1. And what's inside here, this region is the stable region. So there are two different domains you have. Well, when you just press the button, all the writing disappears. Isn't that wonderful to have that system like that? I don't need to use the rubber to clean up, so it's, it's pretty good. And also, if you, if you hit twice, there, there, the slides forward. And if you hit that and that, it comes back. That's also a feature of this electronic whiteboard. Anyway, let's move on. So I have shown you the two things that you have to know. This part is for the analog domain, and this part is for the state domain. Our digital signal processing falls into this part. However, then and there, we will be recalling the knowledge that we have gained in the S plane to translate into, uh, into that plane. Now we'll come back to that. So our concentration in this chapter is in here. How are you going to give a signal? How am I going to get X at? Knowing X at, how am I going to X theta? It is a physical response. How am I going to get it? That's the idea of this, of this chapter. Is. And also, there, are the, um, there is the um, stable region and unstable region. We're going to look at it. Okay? So what is Laplace transform? You all know Laplace transform is normally used to do analyze a, a continuous time domain system, looking at transient and stability of a system. Similarly, the set transform, if you use it, you are basically trying to analyze and look at the structure of a discrete time system and to solve different equations. So we concentrate on set transform. So what is the set transform? The definition is given here. If you take a signal xn, that's your discrete time signal, multiply it by psi to the minus n, and sum them between minus infinity to plus infinity, you get the transform of a signal. Where the that, what is it? If R e to the j theta is related to R e to j, where theta is the digital frequency. When R equal to 1, if you make R equal to 1, that will become e to the j theta, and that's your circle we talked about, it, unit circle. What is this? Unit circle. And its amplitude is 1. So this transform, the definition of this transform is a full two-sided transform because it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And if, if you have a causal system, that's the first probably a name that you haven't come across. I'm sure you have done second year systems and uh, circuits and systems. You have come across it. In causal system, Xn, the signal, is zero when n is less than zero. What does that mean is a causal system, in, we have done in chapter two on this, you will find if this is your signal, that part is all zeros. That's a causal system. If you look at a non-causal system, there, I can just remove this. Uh, if you take a non-causal system, where you will find the, the signal there, and also, in the negative part, also you have got a signal value. Then this is a non causal system. What well, we are looking at a causal system when n is less than zero, it's zero. So in that case, that equation that you have already done, this equation, that will go to zero, so it will come as n equals zero to infinity. This transform is called one-sided transform. For real signals, you will find and uh, this will be zero, therefore we will be using this one all the time for real signal. So that is just the definition of the transform. Now you come in and have a look. The, the set transform, if you look at it, if you go back and see, look at it again. If you expand this, this becomes as a power series.
So what I am going to do is I'm going to take a, 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 a sequence which is 1 when n is greater than 0, is 0 when it's less than 0. This is basically a step sequence or unit step sequence. And if you write the set transform for this, which will be x stat is equal to sigma, which will become as n equals 0, n equals 0 to infinity, and then xn, which is 1 times set to the minus n, which is I have already written here. And if you expand this, you get 1 set to the minus 1 set to the minus and so on. This looks like a geometric series. And if you, go to, if you have a geometric series, you know, and for example, if you have got a geometric series, R squared plus R cubed plus and so on, so on, it's, 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 uh, it's summation to infinity. That means it has got infinite m, it's infinity is 1 over 1 minus R. As long as mod R is less than 1. You have done this before a geometric series. So you can see this is also a geometric series. This is the common ratio R, which is equal to set to the minus 1. And we will assume this will have a sum when mod that is called R is less than 1. So if you move on to the next slide, you will see that if I expand that, that's your uh, geometric series. And it becomes as this. Now, if you substitute 1 over 1 minus 1 over that, that becomes as 1 over 1, that minus 1 over that, that goes to the top, and that becomes that, that over that minus 1. So, you can see the set transform is valid everywhere outside the circuit, based on mod set to the minus 1 is less than 1, that means 1 over that is less than 1, therefore that is from here greater than 1. This is our modulus, it's greater than 1. Greater than 1 means this is 1, so this area is the area, region of third portion. So, mod set equal to 1 is the unit circle. So, region and convergence, R or C, we call it R or C, is outside in this case. So that's the basic concept of a simple step sequence. You don't need to prove all of these, but the proof is important to know because there are questions where these will come in. Not to prove this, but something else. Now we take another example that where not that is greater than 1 except converges, not that is less than 1 except diverges. So we take a case where that equals 2. So this one, if you work it out, it becomes 1 over 2. That's the summation. If you take that equal to 0.5, and if you do the summation, it just diverges. It increases. It diverges. So you have to make sure that for convergence in this case, what's that should be greater than 1. That means you know yourself, one over one such should be less than one. That's what we looked at earlier. So, what is the boundary then? So basically, we will find regional convergence is bounded by the unit circle, which is the radius one. Here is another example that you have. It's a delta sequence now. We have done the step sequence. We have just done, have done the step sequence that is un, and we said uz for x that is equal to that over x that minus 1. That's the transform for that. Let's take a delta n sequence. What is delta n sequence is? Basically, delta, it only have value equal to 1 when n equals 0. Otherwise, zero. So if you just multiply these all, you answer this one. So the step transform of delta n is equal to one. Let's take another example where geometric sequence a to the n. 
Just apply the same thing, a to the x, x to the minus n. You don't need to remember all of this. You would have a table, and you can look up the table for this, which is 1 over a over z. And you just multiply here and flip around to get z over z minus a. And for this to be converted, that value, our value, common ratio should be less than 1. That means you just multiply there, mod a less than mod z, that's what you have here. So if you make A equal to 1, as we did before, it becomes as a unit step, and this is to a uh, mod, uh, step transform. And you can actually think carefully them here. You can, uh, you can, you can think carefully that um, if A is uh, less than 1, so you come back to this, then A is less than 1, and the convergence are there, and if A is greater than 1, then, then it, it, it can diverge. And I come back to that a bit later on and, and explain that. For the moment, you, just, you need to know that uh, the, the, the set transform properties. The next sequence that we want to look at is xn is equal to e to the j is t n t. It's an exponential function. Let's take the set transform. Set transform mm -hmm. e to the j theta n is equal to n0 e to the j theta. That's the xn times epsilon minus n. It's a power series, so the summation is 1 over 1 minus r. Common ratio would be e to the j theta over over that is our common ratio. If you work it out, that's what it worked out to be. It will be, in this one, it will be the common ratio. Um, you can actually expand this if you want it, and you, you can work it out, and this will, this will happen. Now, if you simplify this one, you get this goes up, and that's to a, that. Now, to do further, I'm just multiplying this one by set the e to the j theta out and bottom. You can do that without any problem. Why am I doing that? This is the reason behind it. In a minute, I'll show you. And when I do that, this is on the top. This is on the denominator. If you multiply these out, this is what you get. When you have that, you have to think, what am I going to do with this? Yes, we have got an equation, e to the j theta, is equal to cos theta plus j sine theta. And e to the power of minus j theta is equal to cos theta minus j sine theta. If you add them together, what will happen is if you add, add them both, you get e to the j theta plus e to the power minus j theta, that's these two sides, this one, equal to 2 cos theta, because this one will cancel out with that. So therefore, I could now say this part can be replaced by 2 cos theta, and that's what I'm going to do here. When I do that, my equation now becomes that transform of exponential function is equal to this. Now you can say I'm going to combine the real part and imaginary part of a complex number, which I, when I do that, that's my real part of the complex number. That's my imaginary part of the complex number. Now you could say we are going to expand this, this part as e to the power j, uh, uh, j theta n is equal to cos uh, n theta plus j sine n theta, which is what I have done here. Now you can equate the part, real part, is equal to real part, and imaginary part is equal to imaginary part. If I do that, I'm getting the set transform of cos and theta and set transform of sine and theta. So you move that, now you, have, you can have a look here, you equate real part to real part, imaginary part to imaginary part, you get set transform of cos and theta, which is a cosine function, and you get that, and subtract minus theta is that. Now you will ask a question, do you have to prove this? 
No. You don't need to remember the proof. If you are doing complex analysis in the mathematics department, of course you have to do it. Here is only application. The table will be given, but this thinking is very, very useful. So, you will be given a table of what is the transform of cos and theta, what is the transform of sine and theta. These two are given for you, and all you need to know is how to manipulate it. Now we come back, we have explained the basis of the transform. Now we come back and look at the properties of the transform. What are the properties of the transform? The basic properties. If I have A times Xn plus B times Yn, I take the set transform, I get A times of Xx and B times of Yz. The simple thing you are noticing here is, if you have Xn, you have discrete signals, and if you take the transform, you get x that. This, this arrow shows you, so I've got another arrow showing you that if you take inverse the transform, you get x and back. That's why you have these two arrows, you know. You will wonder why you have two arrows. It's both ways you can work. If you now take the input signal shifted by k sample, and what is the set transform? It will become that to the minus k takes that. That's your set transform. It will be set to the minus k times x that. It's your set transform. Have a look at it very carefully. So take an example. That set transform of x in minus 1. It's only a single unit delay. So it will be set to the minus 1 x that. Because x provides you x that. So in minus 2. So this will become set to the minus 2, x that. So that's your set transform property. So take signal here. Xn is your discrete signal. You are passing through one delay unit. You get Xn minus 1. Which is, if you take in the set transform domain, Xn set transform is x that. And passes through a delay, you get set to the minus 1 times x that. And in, in previous books, when you write this in time domain, they normally represent this as uh, a time domain, which is the one sample. If you do it in set domain, they normally write this as one unit delay. But people have mixed things around. Now, this is the convention that you use. This one, no matter whether it's a time signal or set, set domain signal, this is kind of, this key is kind of moving away, not Many people use T as a delay anymore. They simply say, set to the minus one is a unit delay. Let's, let's look at time reversal property. What is time reversal? <clears throat> you take the input signal, that's a signal like that, in time, and flip them. So if you have a signal like that, time reversal, if this is six n, x minus n means now that's x minus n. That's called time reversal. If you do that, a signal, that's this signal, and take a set transform of that, you can show if that transform is x one over that. That means if x n, if you take that transform, take that, if you've got x minus n, the set transform is going to be x 1 over z. Okay? Or oh, you can write as x plus or minus 1. You can write that way as well. And here is an example where you have been asked to find the transform of uh, uh, signal which is minus un. What is minus un? This is un, this is 1. Minus un is that way. That's, this is un, this is u minus n. U, uh, no, this is not correct. This is not correct. This is not correct. Sorry. My apologies. This should be u minus n. Have a look. So make a note. That's not right. You can see it here. Here it is. This is u, this is minus u. If you do know, earlier we clicked for, for a 
unit sample, unit uh, step function, if you do step transform, this is what it means. We proved it. If you have u minus n, all you need to do is wherever that you replace the set of the minus 1. So it becomes 1 over 1 minus that. So two different answers. So un set transform will give you set over set minus 1. Then you have got u minus n. If you do set transform, you get 1 over 1 minus that. All these are given in a table. You don't need to really worry about it. But you must have understanding. What are you doing, actually? These are properties I'm doing it, and then I'll do the application for you. Here is another example where you've got multiplicative. You take a signal, Xn, and multiply by x, kind of an exponent mm -hmm. signal. If you do that, your know, transform is going to be a to the minus 1 set. So wherever is that, you replace by a to the minus 1 set. And similarly, if you say e to the j in theta, and take a set transform, it will be a set e to the minus set theta times that. We will use the application later. And this another one that you need to learn is differentiation in the time domain, you know, set domain, where you have a signal extent multiplied by n. And if you take set transform, which is exactly the same as minus that differentiation of the original set transform. That means x set is your set transform of xn when you when you do set transform. You take x set and differentiate them and multiply by minus set is equal to taking set transform of n xn. Taking set transform of n xn. Now we come to convolution properties. Discrete convolution. We have learned that before. If you have a signal, if you have got a box here, and we know what the impulse response is, we know how to measure it. This is xn, this is xn, this is yn. We know the equation yn is equal to xn. This is convolved with that. This is convolution terminology. We can actually show, if you have convolution in time domain, this is time domain, which is, if you take the set transform, this convolution sign comes as a multiplication. So it is x set multiplied by x set. So instead of convolving two signal, two time signal, which you are not, not sure how to convolve, you take the set transform of each and every one of them and multiply them. If you do that, you get the transform. Let me just do this proof again. I will say this proof is it's good to know, but it's not that you have to know everything, because it's useful to know this one. Here is xn and hk, and I'm taking the transform. I'm going to write xn is uk un minus k. That's your convolution part. Then Hn is you will have Hn minus k and uk. Have I, have I missed it? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me back, let me back, let me back. Let me go to this back again. Um, here is our signal, xs. In, you go back and look at your convolution formula. Convolution formula says xn h n minus k. xk h n minus k is there. Then whenever you have n minus k, you'll be associated with u n minus k because you don't want the negative part to be there. And x k means you'll have u k. So that's the convolution of two signals. Now what we do is once you've done the convolution, we would now say what is the set transform of? This is the equation for convolution. Set transform of it is sigma n equal to zero to infinity of all of these. Multiple by set to the minus n. Now we group them. How do we group them? We group them u k and x k together plus 
So I do kick, and then un minus k minus k set to minus k together. And if you look at it very carefully and do a substitution, m equal to n minus k in here, this will become as that one. And this becomes this one. And now you can look at and then simply say these two, this will give you x that, and this is going to give, give you x that, because the definition of the transform. And if you go on to the next slide, you can show, keep going in there, you can show that by taking the, that will become x, x k, x that, and that will become x that. So you've got x, y that is equal to x that times h that. Go back again. And this one, what you have here now, you need to separate the set to the minus m, set to the minus k, and move the set to the minus k with this one, and keep the set to the minus m. And that's your set transform, and this is your set transform. So eventually you're going to have, if you have a signal HN and its impulse response is HN, you know from chapter 2, the output is Y, convolved. And if you have the set transform of that, and the set transform of that, and the set transform of that, then you can write an equation, output is equal to input multiplied by the transfer function. Or in time domain, output is equal to input convolved by the impulse response. So you can see the convolution converted into multiplication. The proof is not very necessary that you need to remember, but the methodology how I'm doing is important because there may be another question where you may have to use this methodology. Having said that, when most of the application, we don't spend time on methodology of proving, we will be concentrating only the application of this. We have learned the basic set transform. Now we apply the concept, the set transform to defense equation. And that's the important part for you first. The set transform table will be given to you. Therefore, even if you do not know how to prove, you can always look up the table. So I don't think that's that. that uh, it's a, proof is not a major problem. By do, doing the proof, you get a deeper understanding. Okay. Let's look at the concept of transfer functions. You all know what the transfer function is. If in Laplace transform you have learned, if you have got a signal here, if this is xs Laplace transform, which is xs xs, which is xt Laplace transform, and if this is hs, and this is ys output ys, you will say ys is equal to hs times xs, you multiply. And you learn that in Laplace transform. And the same thing holds in our set transform as well. If you have a system, what will happen is this discrete system, that become h set, that become h set, that become n, that become that, so everything is set transform. Okay? Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce you uh, a transfer from, um, uh, sorry, different equation that you've already come across, and I'm going to use the transform for that. And see, that's the signal yn. What's yn is the current output, remember? Which is equal to a0 times of current input, a1 times of previous input, a2 times of previous input, two samples before, and b1 times of past output and P2 times of past output previous sum. That's the difference equation. In order to get this current output, you have to do that. And now, if you want to look at the value, you normally say n equal to zero, find the value y naught. Then you say n equal to one, find the value y one, and so on. That's the interpretation which we have looked at before. Now what I'm after in this chapter is, if I take a set transform of this, what happens? Y, yn will become yz, 
A node will remain A node, Xn will become Xx, A1 will remain A1. This is the quantum of that is that to the minus 1 multiplied by x factor. Remember, we did that before. Then, a2 will remain a2. This one will become as that to the minus 2 multiplied by x factor. Then, uh, b1 will remain b1. yn minus 1 because y set times that to the minus 1. b2 will remain b2. yn minus 2 will y set that to the minus 2. That's just a transform. Now you move once you have done that, now you move, now you move um, things to one side. That means you combine that bit, that bit, that bit, bring them all to this side. You have an equation then, y z into 1 minus b z to minus 1 beta. You take y z common. And then you keep you uh, x that to one side, and that take x that out, you get that. Now your transfer function is y divided by x. When you do that, this will be that divided by that. So your transfer function for this different equation, a bit of a a naught a1 plus a1 plus the minus 1 plus a2 divided by 1 minus b1. That is your transfer function. Now, remember, when you are doing this, there is a small hitch there. Students tend to make mistake on this. When you draw a structure based on this, the coefficient is plus here. Do you see that? So, if I am drawing a structure based on that, I will put in my multiplier is plus V1. I'll show you example in a minute. That means, for example, if I take an example, say yn is equal to a naught xn minus b1 yn minus 1. And if you ask to draw a graph, what will you do? You will say, here is xn, my xn comes in here, and it's multiplied by a naught, yep, and then I'm adding here, and this is my yn, and I have a delay here, and then my, my, my minus b1 here comes in front here. That's my structure for that. Is. That's my delay. Now you will find, if you draw the same structure using the transform, using this equation, you will find this minus 1 will become plus. That means you can see here, here is a plus b1, become minus b1 here. Here plus b2 will become minus b2. So if I do the same question that I have, and if I take the set transform of this, can I now come here and do set transform? Y z is equal to a node x z minus b1, now y z is to the minus 1. And if you bring it to this side, you'll have y z times 1 plus v1 that is the minus 1 is equal to a naught x z. Therefore, you will say, uh, uh, if, you are, if you are drawing this structure now, you have to remember that here is plus there. See? So, this part plus means in, on the diagram, it will be always minus. If this is minus, in the diagram, it's always plus. That's only in set domain. If you are doing on, on high domain diagram, then there's no problem. So I do one, one more example. It might be, it's not easy to kind of detect it immediately. You need to do one example. All I'm saying is that if you draw, if you draw a structure based on that, then there's no problem. You would just write exactly what's there. But if you draw a structure based on this, the same structure will come in. But it won't be minus B1. You will put plus B1. It won't be minus B2. It will be plus. Not to, this one will remain the same. No change for the numerator and the denominator on the diagram, on the structure. These signs have to be changed, which I will show you in the example in a minute. 
you will be now given an equation all the way around part of function given find find the um, different equation remember this is a part of the function but that's not good to us because we want to have our part of function always z to the minus 1 z to the minus 2 and so on we cannot have that it's not a delay only z to the minus 1 is a proportional that's a delay so therefore you have to make sure that in order to get z to the minus 1 everything has to be divided by z square up and down when you do that divide everything all normal by divide everything by z square what will happen if you divide this by z square you will get pi z to the minus 1 divide this by z square you get 2 z to the minus 2 divide this by such square you get 1 divide this by such square you get that and that now that polynomial that transfer function is in the correct form that we want is in the correct form now how do you find the how do you find the difference equation you say x that is equal to that now you do cross multiplication there and there when you do that you get y z Times three that times that is equal to this. This. Now you go back and look at your transfer function, an inverse transfer. You had earlier x n minus one. If you take the transform of it, you get x that that is the minus one. You had the transform x n minus two because x that that is the minus two. So you do now backward. If I have this, I can get that. So you say go back and look at it and say, "Sorry, what do I have? I have y z. My inverse is y n. I put three y z such as minus one. My inverse is three y n minus one. Delay is only one. My inverse here is n minus two. Delay is two. My inverse here is n minus one. My inverse here is n minus two. So that's how you do this. Uh, 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 it's called inverse transform, and then you move all choose this one and this one to the other side, and you get your different equation. This is your different equation from this transfer function. So the question is, if you are given this transfer function, can you draw a structure? If you are given this different equation. Can you draw a structure? Of course we can. Now the question comes into play. I want to draw the structure for this. How do I do it? Right? I'm looking at this, and how am I going to do it? The structure. Okay, I'm going to have an atom. I could have x that's coming in. It's not x n now. It's in third domain. X is coming in, and it says five set to the minus one. So I can have set to the minus one here, and I can have five. So there, there, and I'm going to add these two together. I got, I got what? X, X that comes here, and sorry, I just made a small mistake. Sorry. You can see here there is no X in there. Eh? So if you go, if you go back here again, this multiply by that, that multiply by that. So what I'm going to have is my x n is coming here x n x that x that coming is five set to the minus one so I take that delay set to the minus one and I multiply by five and have that ready then I got two set to the minus two delay by set to the minus one and multiply by two and then I add these together here. I get that signal. That's the top part, feet forward part, and there's nothing coming here because there's no x n, there's no number. Now we have to have feet back part. I must have y n as we have normally. So you get a plus and a y n here. Why is that? Then I have three z to the minus one. So I take here and delay, and here. Remember, I said if you got a plus three, it must be minus three here. Don't forget that. Add them, and I need that as well. So that will be such a minus one again, and and that and that goes. 
and that coefficient will be minus 2. So if you come back, you put minus 2 here, even if it's plus, if it's plus 2, it will be minus 2. But you can see these two can be seen from your different situation. They will represent the correct value. When it comes to transfer function, and when you're drawing the structure, you must be careful. Here's another example of the transform. Xn is given as un minus un minus 10. Find the set transform. Very simple. You could write this way if you want it. Or you just write x that is equal to basically un. We know uh, if you write this as a power series, this way, you, if you expand this, it will be a power series of up to 0 to 9. So the summation of a power series, can I write this here? 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed and plus r, well, r to the 4 plus dot 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 plus r n minus 1 will be equal to 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. That's summation to n terms. Summation to infinity, this will be, this will be going to, oh, well, right, going to 1. So, summation to n terms is, we put 9 here, that means n means you could add one more, so 1 minus, that to the power, uh, power of 10, but here's I put r, r to the minus 1, r to the minus 2 you should have. And divide by 1 minus r, which is 1 minus x to the minus 1. And that's how you find out the, the, the transform of a two function subtractor. You see here? Take another example of the transform. This is a bit difficult. This, this is a bit different. And um, it's just, just as illustration again. Sometimes you don't come across this, but here is alpha to the n minus alpha to the n u n minus 1. So what you have to do is to take the transform, you use the basic definition, and you write that down. Once you have done that, you now start to plot this waveform. And what is this waveform is? is u minus n plus 1. So u n is here, u n plus 1 is here. So minus u n plus 1 means, that's minus 1 here, it looks like this. See that? So basically, your summation is, there's no point you doing any summation after this, because they're all zero. So your summation starts from minus infinity, only up to minus 1. That's how you have here minus infinity to 1. You must draw this diagram, otherwise you can't do it. So do you understand? That's un. That's, this one is un plus 1. At minus 1. And if you want minus un plus 1, that is exactly this one, that's what you want. This one. It will be like this. So you are limited minus infinity to one because here is all zeros. So that's what you have. So you, so that's gone now. Once you put the limit, that's gone. And you now work out, move the minus sign outside. This alpha over that to the power n, and this is the power series again. And work out this its, its summation then. And what you could do here is, you could put in, instead of starting at minus 1, you could say you're going to start from, remember in summation you can switch them around, you can say you're going to start from mi minus infinity to 0, and you're going to substitute this value first, and you substitute, you get 1, and because you're switching this, uh, this limit, you get a minus sign there, minus sign here, and this is what you end up. Just a simple mathematical manipulation. Do you understand that? I have got minus infinity to minus 1. So I would say I am going to go from um, uh, 0 to infinity 
I want to do, right? I can do that by switching these uh, 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 switching uh, switching these uh, limits and changing the sign. Have a look at this. If you don't, I have not room to explain. If you don't understand, you can ask. Always ask. But it's just to show you how to drive. And as I said to you again and again, this is a digital signal processing course. It's not a transform course. Therefore, you you won't be asked to prove transform, but you'll be asked to use them all the time. So here's the diagram, the one I, I drew, un plus 1 and minus un plus 1. And if you work out, it's, 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 a, it's a subtransform. Why is that equal to 1 minus 1 over this? Okay. That's just a subtransform of that particular signal. It's, a, it's an example where people um, uh, will come across this sort of sequence and sometimes wonder what's the value. And sometimes the table don't give you immediately. In this case, you have to evaluate. And for that particular uh, diagram, I don't know whether you understand what's a pole and a zero. Then you've done it. Pole and zero. Zero means the roots of the numerator. Zero means the roots of the numerator, pole means roots of the denominator. How do you get the root? You make that equal to zero. That's the root. Here you make set minus alpha equal to zero, then set becomes set equal to alpha. You've got two roots, sorry, it's not infinity, it's alpha. You've got two roots here. You've got two roots. One is zero, which is for zero, and the other root is alpha. That's for that's the pole. So if you look at in the diagram, zero is at that point and alpha is at that point. Now this is non modulus equal to one. This is modulus is equal to alpha. Oh, I'm writing alpha as infinity all the time. That's alpha. Okay. So this is just the pole zero plot, and I'll be doing more more in a minute. Right. How do you plot pole zero? Okay, I'll come back to it in a minute. This is just to show you the pole zero. This is the region of convergence. Now, earlier we did discrete convolution. I don't know whether that. You have gone through chapter two. We learned a lot about discrete convolution. And I showed you a graphical method. You take a signal. You take the second signal you want to convert, you rotate, you flip one, and you then shift it and multiply, or shift this one and multiply and add them. You move this direction. I've done that before. But the, the, the easy way of doing convolution sometimes, so easy. What you do, if you want two sequences on a convol, if you can find the subtransform, convolution becomes multiplication. So what you do here is, if, if you are asked to convol two signals, you say, right, I'm going to do convolution, but not as a convolution, as a multiplication. I will give you the one signal with three values. I'll give the second signal with six values. This means, this means, x2, 0, equal to 1, x2, 1, equal to 1, and so on. Right? And it's 0 elsewhere. So my question is now, I need to convolve these two. I say, no, I'm not going to convolve because it's too difficult sometimes. I'm going to do multiplication. So I have to do set transform of x1, set transform of x2, and multiply them. Now, how do I do that one? So, when you do the set transform of sat, that's the set transform, you get 1 minus 2 set to the minus 1 set to the minus 2. That's the position where they are. That's position number 1, 2. Sorry, this is position number zero, this is position number one, position number two. If it's in position number two, that's the minus two. Take this one. First one is one, that's the minus one, two, three, four, five, altogether six values. Now you multiply these one, these two multiply them one at a time. When you multiply, the output is going to be that. That's why I said. Now you take inverse transform of that. When you do inverse transform, you get yn. 
and the first value inverse is 1, if you have got set to the minus 1, it will become as minus 1. Then set to the minus 2 is missing, 3 is missing, 4 is missing, 5 is missing. So they got zero values. Then 6 is minus 1, 7 is plus 1. So that's your convolved output. So if you use MATLAB to convolve that one and that one, you will find this out you get. So you can see that if you are asked to do convolution in time domain, and if you are not restricted to do it in time domain, you immediately do it in, 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 in set domain by multiplying, finding the integers that transform of the sequence, and then multiplying them, you'll get um, uh, transform. Here is an example I like you to look at very carefully. Very simple example. The transfer of uh, the different equations given to you here. What does the different equation say? Yn, current output equal current input plus past output multiplied by A. So I draw the structure. X comes in, Yn is here, delay, and A, and this one add up. That's my structure. Perfect. Now you do the transform for this one. Take the transform, what would you get? Yz equal to Xz plus A is at minus, that will be A is at minus 1 by Z. Now move this to this side and take the transfer function. Hz equal to Yz divided by Xz equal to 1 over 1 minus Az. Sometimes you are only given that. You don't need to find that at all. Sometimes you are given this. You have to find this or don't need to find. Depends. Now, if you ask to draw this structure, you say, okay, x set has to come in first, you got that. Multiply by 1, so there's nothing there. Then y set, this means always y set, y set, delayed by one sample, so delay by one sample. Multiply by a, that's correct. Why you say this minus sign, if you have got a minus sign, it will change to plus a here. In this case, plus a will remain as plus a. That's the difference. In, if you draw the difference between these two diagrams, are these are exactly the same diagram, no difference at all. Only thing you have to be careful is, this is time value, this is set domain value. This is time value, this is set domain value. And if you, you draw this one from here, by using plus that here. Now, if you draw from here, everything is same as this, Except you just have to be careful. Don't put minus a. If you've got a minus a there, you must have a plus a here. If you've got a plus a here, it must be a minus a here. That's the part you have to be careful on this. Apart from that, you can draw this one, you can draw this, or you can draw this. But most of the time, you'll be asked, you'll be given this. Or you'll be given this, and you have to convert this and draw the structure. Sometimes the structure is given. You need to write the transfer function. You need to take the inverse transform. So all sort of things, all possibilities you have to, you need to know here. Very carefully, you can just work out. You are given this, find this, then draw that. It's one option. Or you are given this structure, find this from the structure, and then find the different equation. That's the the option you have. These all what you are doing now, why are we doing this manipulation? You are trying to draw a digital discrete, uh, sorry, discrete time system using our basic adder, multiplier, and the delay unit. And by doing this, you'll get a complex system developed soon, like, you know? Here's an example I want you to look at, both of you, and write me the equation transfer function. I have a, I have a, I got x and come, x that's coming here, and I got plus, and then it goes to minus 1, and it has got a minus a1, and goes there. And then I got a signal coming out here, and it's added up, and addition, and go to a delay y z, and then delay set to the minus 1, and come back here as V1, and then add up. And you have been asked to 
draw the transfer function. You must write the transfer function for this. So let's do it now. Take a paper, sheet of paper, based on what you have understood. Why don't you write the transfer function? I give you just two minutes to write the transfer function, then I will write it on the board for you. Hopefully you have done it. Right. One thing you have to be careful is when you're going here, this is your feed forward system. The transfer function or the polynomial for feed forward system comes from the numerator. So I could say my transfer function hits that is equal to a line I put across and I say what is my feed forward system is? X that comes in directly to it. That means one. Then it's delayed. Then I say and multiply by that to the minus A1. So I say minus A1 that's the minus one. That's all on the top. X set directly is one and A1 that's the minus one. And then Look at this one. Y set is fed back. Y set means one. Now it's fed back and delayed. So something like minus or plus you can have V1 such as a minus one. You cannot have plus. Why? If this is plus, if it's a plus coefficient, then on the transfer function it has to end up as a minus. That's the part you have to be careful on that. So anything in the plus, in the feedback part, anything on plus here, that has to come as a minus. If it was minus B1, and if you had a scenario where this was a minus B1, let's take a scenario where this was minus B1, right? That was what you were given. In that situation, this should become as plus. That's the part you must be careful, right? Okay, that's just an example of the transform and how to write the transfer function. It's the first order transfer function because this one determines the order or, or power. It's a first order transfer function. Let's take another example where you could have an example here, I have going to have a signal coming here, and I call it XS, and it's multiplied by the A naught, and goes in here as plus. And then I get another signal here, set to the minus 1, multiply by minus A1, and goes in here. And I have got another signal, or another delay unit, come in here and multiply this as A2, and that goes in there. And then the output is another part, and that's my y, y set. And I delay that by set to the minus 1. And I have got a V1 going here. And then, then I delay again here. And then I have got a V2, which is a minus V2, which goes in here. And now you've been asked to draw, to the, find the uh, transfer function. How do you do the transfer function? Well, you should be able to write very quickly the based on what I've explained. So you don't you don't need to look at the board. Keep writing on your on your notebook the transfer function, then I'll write on the board for you. Okay? So you don't need to look at it. So I got two minutes for you. Here it is. Write the forward path first. Okay? And then divide by the feed back path transfer, uh, the polynomial. If you've done both of them, you should get a transfer function, correct transfer function. Here is what I'm going to write. Fix that is my transfer function. I've got a feed forward part and feedback part. My feed forward part, if you look at my hand, is going that way. That means x set multiplied by a naught. So first one is a naught plus. This is set minus one delay, but it's a minus a one. So I take out my plus. Oh. I take out my plus and I say minus A1 such as a minus 1. Correct? And then it's delayed again and set minus 2. So plus A2 set minus 2. 
then you come here, why set you have? When you have y set, you want to make sure when you have y set, you, you need to have one here. So what you have is one. Well, I can use my, my finger to write one. Then you have got b1. Don't check it. You have got a b1 there. If you have got b1, it must have a minus here. Don't forget. So minus b1 set to the minus one. Right. Then you have got another delay, don't okay. forget another delay you have, but the coefficient is minus b2. If that's the case, then you have to make sure that this comes in here with plus b2 plus minus 2. Okay? So that is your transfer function in this case, basically. Let's move on. These are basic set transform tables. For delta n is 1, 2 n is that, alpha n. I have proved some of these. They are all given here. Cosine, sine. So this will be given in the exam, and you can use these pretty, pretty well, like, you know. And set transform properties. If you've got x n, if you take set transform, you get x set. If you have that, and take set transform with that. If you have delay, it's that one, and you've got a in, a in to the x in, it's that one, and so on. And I've done all of these, and you have, if you convolve in time domain, you multiply in, in set domain. All these properties are explained, it's all in a table form for you. One of the things I've already mentioned earlier, always remember, if you add the summation, and if you have n minus one term, here you will be n term there, and that's your summation. If n goes to infinity, right, and sum of infinity will come as 1 over set to the minus 1. And you have to make sure this is not right. This is set to the minus 1 should be less than 1. Okay, it's not set minus 1. That's not right. Okay? You need to know, this is also normally given, not as infinity sum given. Normally this is given to you as a table in your exam or in your tutorial, you are normally given that. So basically, you need to understand how you apply the transform and where you apply, how you apply that you need to know. Inverse the transform. Now, we have already touched upon inverse the transform, but inverse the transform can be done in many ways. First method is to, well, there are many methods available, right? We'll come back to the methods in a minute. You can use partial fraction to do inverse, uh, uh, inverse transform. That's the easiest one. I'll demonstrate a few examples for that. And you know if you have, in, this is how you write. Inverse means set the minus 1, and fix that, and fix that. That means inverse set transform of x set will give you x set. You don't need to write all these. You can always say inverse, inverse value this. But this is just a, there are methods available for inverse transform. Uh, transform. Let me go back again. Okay. I don't know what's happening, but, but there are two methods available. One is called power series method. Other one is the residue method. If you have done, if you've done complex analysis, you would have done this method, inverse transform method. And these two methods can be used to find inverse transform. I want to go back. I saw another equation there. Ah, here. I missed it, you see, so I'm going to go back here. You've been asked to find the xn value, and you know this is your transfer function given, and how do you find xn? Very hard to do, it's not easy. So what you do, partial fraction, and you do partial fraction, you factorize this first, you have done the factorization, once you have factorized them, you can leave out the z out part, and then say a that, and B here, because you know partial fraction anyway, this is the first order, therefore it should be A and B on the top. 
and then you use whatever method you know for partial fraction, and you find out the value of A and B, and they become that one and that one. Now remember to do inverse transform, you need to have set to the minus one. So what you do, first step is to multiply them inside first, you got that. Then you divide by that, so if you do, or in, or in this case you don't divide, you just take, um, let me have a look, 4 over 5, uh, 1 second, there was an error, there was a mistake here. Basically, in the set transform domain, you can either, this, this is not there, this shouldn't be there, that's, that's the mistake. Okay, now you have it. So what you do, basically, this is what you have. Look at your table. The table, go back and look at the table, it tells you the inverse set transform is that. And the table also tells you the inverse set transform is that one. And using the table, you can actually find um, uh, the inverse of transform, so x then become, this is your x then. So for that transfer function, or x then is this. If you want to know, look at the table, you want to do, look at the table here, very basically you go back, couple of steps, backwards, 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 there you are. The table that you looked at just now was that over um, set minus a. So here is the table, this one is to a to the alpha to the n. This works out to be z over z minus alpha. That's what you were looking for. It. And all you need to do inverse transform is, if you have in that form, you write as alpha, alpha to the s. And if this is plus, you put minus alpha to the s. That's all you have to do. So this is what I have used here in, in order to get that particular result. Okay, that's what I have used. You can see that. And if it, if it is minus sign, this will be the only one will be there. If this become as plus sign, then you have got a minus 0.5. You can see that? And that's just get used to the set transform table. You need to know this in your in your in your class exam in week four. There will be small transfer function will be given and you need to work out. And if we simply enough, it's not that I am after mathematical Rigor, rigor, I'm um, just after understanding and then by looking at this situation and see whether it's a stable system or unstable system as well, you should be able to see that. Okay? And I'm going to leave this to think about it. If this is an unstable or stable, plot this graph and you will see it's a stable or unstable system. If you're not sure, you can ask me in my discussion class on Monday. Okay, we have covered that. We have covered that. Now we have come to relationship between the set transform and the Laplace transform. This is a relationship. The relationship between Laplace transform and set transform is this equation. That is equal to e to the st. t is your sampling period, yeah? And S is known as sigma plus J omega. This is your transient part and this is your steady frequency part. And if you substitute that one here, this is what you get. You then group that one and that one separately. You get that one and that one. Omega T is we have defined as our theta, remember? So we can say that the modulus of that will be that part. That and and then we can say the 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 angle of this transform the angle is theta that is here which is omega t which is two pi f over f s and this is your relationship that you will be using you may not use it immediately but you will be using it later on in 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 various applications I'm just only introducing this and uh, you just to know the relationship that's all okay. All it says is that if omega varies from minus infinity to plus infinity, that's an S plane, then it's mapped onto the set plane as shown in figure 2.10. 
that basically I have explained this at the start of the slide, and this is what happened. Oh, I have explained at the start of the slide. This transfer function is equal to e to the power of st. What it does is it, it takes the whole uh, uh, left hand plane and maps them inside and keeping this as a unit circuit. And the theta is going from 0 to pi and going from 0 to minus pi. And somebody asked me a question earlier in the class, what's the relationship between f, the frequency, analog frequency f, and theta? Theta is the digital frequency. And you will find that the analog frequency is, say, example here, f s over 2, half the sampling frequency, it can show this is going to be pi. And if this is minus s s over 2 in analog, in digital is minus pi. And if you go for sampling frequency, f s here, this will become a 2 pi. How do we get this relationship? That relationship, this is how you access up analog to digital. That relationship comes from omega t is equal to theta. Omega is 2 pi analog over sampling, sampling frequency, which is equal to theta. Now, you can say, if my theta, if my theta is equal to pi, say if theta is equal to pi, what happened to this? What happened is, 2 pi fa over fs, that can that cancel out, and fa now becomes your fa from this equation, fa becomes fs over 2. That's how you get the relationship. So you say, whenever you've got a pi, when you apply, put in the formula here, from there to there, you find you get fs over 2. That's how you relate that and digital access, access and analog access. When you sample, you only sample up to half the sampling frequency, like if you sample at FS, your information is, according to um, uh, Nyquist's theory, information is up to here, F max, which is FS over 2. You sample at high frequency, and this is only up to that, right, information. Therefore, when you do the spectrum plot, you only plot in that region. Minus pi to plus pi, or fs over 2. Is that, uh, is that, is that clear, or is it difficult? Concept comes in little by little, it's not easy. A lot of students find it difficult to relate the analog frequency and the digital frequency. All I'm saying to them is, use this formula. If you know a value here, substitute it in here, you get the digital value. If you know the digital value, substitute here, you get the analog value. Okay? Now, how are we going to find out the frequency response, the digital frequency response? Let's go back and relook at here. This is our formula, remember? Analog to digital. Sorry, explain the set play. And if you restrict yourself, on the unit circle, what will happen is, this will become as 1. Then, omega t becomes as theta, we know that. So we are going to say our subplane, and we can evaluate frequency response by saying that equal to e to the j theta on the unit circle, on the equal to 1. That means that point is theta equal to 0, that point is theta equal to pi, and that point is theta equal to pi over 2. Pi over 2. What does that mean? Well, sorry. This point is theta equal to pi over 2. What we are saying is that this is how the theta moves. That's our theta. That's our uh, digital frequency. So if you ever want to find out frequency response, what you do is if you have a transfer function h that is equal to 1 over 1 minus that is the minus 1. It's a transfer function. And you want to find out the frequency response, all you do, as according to my slide, is you substitute 
that is equal to e to the j theta, j theta, you get h theta, remember I showed you that, equal to 1 over 1 minus e to the power of minus j theta theta. And then you evaluate that real part and imaginary part, you get your physical response. The same as you are, if you have hs, what you do, 1 over h plus a, if you want to get your physical response, you say h j omega, h equal j omega, you put in, you get 1 over j omega plus a. Same principle here. If you want to do the same thing here, h that gives you get such equal e to the j theta. They are the different things, right? Now, because we derive the such that it must be done on the unit circuit. So if you want to find out the frequency response of a transfer function, you substitute such equal e to the j theta. That means you are finding the frequency response on the unit circuit. So every point here, ra one, ra one, ra one, ra one, if you join them, that's the frequency you're analyzing. That is that frequency. That is that frequency. That is that frequency you're analyzing. So every point on the unit circle corresponds to a frequency between 0 and pi, 0 and minus pi. So how do you do frequency response estimation now? Frequency response estimation is done by looking at your transfer function there and substituting such equal e to the j theta and you get h theta. And h theta will be h theta will be complex, like a complex number. So you can find out the magnitude response, like a complex number, the magnitude. And also, if you want, you can look at the phase as well. Leave out the phase for a moment, and we will visit phase later. So, so that's how you do. Um, uh, that's complex. That's how you do that. Frequency response. Basically, you want to find out, evaluate the frequency response of a discrete time system. You just get your set transform first and substitute statically into the J theta, as you like to the H theta. Here is an example. I have a very good example here which I am going to do, where I've been given a transform, uh, sorry, a, a, a system has got this function. And I've been told A is less than zero, or and it's greater than. Uh, no, this is wrong. This is zero. This is one. Typo error. Typo A is less than one, but greater than zero. It's given. You have been asked to find H theta. H theta is the frequency response. So I can find H theta by taking H set and substituting such equal e to the j theta. So I'm going to do that in the next slide. Well, I haven't done it. Oh, I have, here. So, here is it. And then I substitute, I get 1 a e to the j theta. You can see that? H set is equal to 1 over 1 minus x to minus 1, which is for h theta, which becomes 1 over 1 minus e to the minus j theta, because you're putting that equal to e to the j theta, that's your substitution. So you got that. Once you've got that, then you have, you have to find out the real part of the part. You can write e to the minus j theta as cos theta plus j sine theta, and group them, the 1 and cos theta as the real part, and that one is the imaginary part. And if you have to find the modulus value, you take square root of that squared plus that squared, and you expand that. When you expand it, you get cos squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to 1. When you do that, this is what you get. That is your frequency uh, response. Now you have to plot them. Uh, do you plot this? Exactly what I said earlier. So let's have a look. You say, right, here is my equation. That is my plot. I want to plot against theta. Right. Let me start theta equals zero. I put theta equals zero here. When I put theta equals zero, this will become one over square root of one minus two a plus a squared. That will become one over square root of 
1 minus a whole square, that will become 1 over 1 minus a for me. So I can, uh, uh, 1 over 1 minus a, that is correct. At theta equal to 0, I got 1 over 1 minus a. Then I put in theta equal to pi here. Then cos theta is equal to minus 1. So if you simplify the whole thing again, it will become 1 over 1 plus a. So that's a theta equal to pi. Theta equal to pi corresponds to analog axis is sampling over 2. Digital axis is pi. Now by looking at this, I can do pi over 2, I can do this value, this value, this value. So every value, if you look at it, every value corresponds on the unit circle, starting from there, then that, then that, then that, any division, that's pi over 2, then that, then that, and then that, that's pi, or that's there. So this is the theta values, yeah? Theta equals 0, theta equals, say, pi over 4, maybe, pi over 2, and so on. And what does it look like? And I finished this, and this is my graph, and I'm looking at the response. When I look at the response, my first question is, what is this filter? It's, it's, it's a filter. This transfer function, h set, equal to 1 over 1 minus set to the minus 1, it's a filter. Or 1 minus a, like a set to the minus It's a filter. What filter is this? It's a low pass filter. Because high frequencies are suppressed, low frequencies are enhanced. So it's, this transfer function is a low pass filter. Now the question is for you is, this is what the question is, that you really need to know. You will be, you will be told, here is your transfer function, it set. 1 over 1 minus a is set to the minus 1, and a is less than 1, given. Then you have been asked to draw the structure. So you draw a structure, very easy structure. There you are. There's your x set comes in. There's plus and y set here. Because, and then this goes uh, delay, set to the minus 1, and come in here. This is minus, so it's be plus a and feedback. That's your structure. You've been told by the structure you've done that. And then you have been told, find the impulse response. So you say Hn equal to, you look at your uh, transfer function, like in you know, a inverse transfer function, that will become a a to the n u n. That's your impulse response from inverse transfer function. Once you have done that, so you are given, you are asked to draw, you did that. Then you are asked to find the difference equation. So you go from here, you, your difference equation, you say y set over x set is equal to 1 over 1 minus a set to the minus 1. You first multiply, first multiply, you don't need to do all of those. Once you know it, you can do, you say it will become as yn is equal to xn plus a yn minus 1. That's my difference equation. So you've been asked to do many things. Only you were given that, you were asked to do this, you were asked to do that, you were asked to do that. Then you will be asked, find the frequency response. So what you do, you start from here, substitute, 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 and drop the class. So one simple question has got everything what we have learned in it. And if you can redo this question the way I have explained to you, you've got it. Basically, you've got it. Don't, don't forget, for those who haven't come across this before, it will take some time to pick up. So you have to be patient. You have to redo this again and again. All right? The next part that you need to know is the four zero distribution of the system. You have the method this before, but let me just run through this. H set is your transfer function, Y set is your output, X set is your input. And you can write the system, complex system or simple system, with a polynomial on the top or another polynomial at the bottom. But remember, that will be always one. Always that will be one. Okay? And if you factorize the polynomial on the top, What's the polynomial? It could be 1 plus 
e1 e to the minus 1 plus e2 to the minus 2 over like maybe a naught here 1 minus e1 to the minus 1 plus e2 to the minus 2 it's a polynomial of second order and a polynomial of second order second order means two delays in your system that's the minus 1 to the minus 1 two delays but not can ever i can factorize this most of the cases will factorize them and you can have a roots set 1 set 2 and set m m roots here you factorize this one you get p1 p2 pl as l roots the roots on the top are called zeros the roots on the bottom are called poles when you are factorizing you tend to take out a or outside the bracket and you divide them but Uh, you don't need to go into so much of detail because um, you can still work without taking out a naught, but it's a lot easier taking out a naught and then factorizing. So the we have got now zeros is is maybe real or complex. Then we've got poles p1. They could be real or complex. Depends on the uh, depends on the uh, function. A naught is the only constant that you have. so we can now say we could actually display all the information available on a transfer function now information available on a transfer function 1 minus 0.6 6 7 minus 1 you can simply say yes this has got uh, if you redo this one it will become a set over set minus 0.6 then you can say this has got a zero and set equal to zero This has got a pole is set equal to 0.6, and pole zero diagram then become very important because by knowing the poles where they are, by knowing the zeros where they are, we can study about the system. So here is an example of a pole zero. You can say, right, this is my unit circle. This is my unit circle. Unit circle radius equal to. Now I have got a zero here. What that position is? Well, this position is my angle theta equal to zero, and this position is my angle theta equal to pi. Or you could say theta equal to minus pi. So that's all all right. Right. So I have got uh, this is real axis. Remember, I have got a zero on the real axis, and I've got a four on the real axis. Then. This is complex because that's a real and that's complex. So this is a complex conjugate. So really, if you look at the poles are uh, located at 0.5 plus or minus 0.j. This is j axis, and also poles are located at 0.75 that one. And the zero is at that equal to that equal to one in that direction. That's one. In that position, that equal to minus one. So basically, I'm going back to you, and you're going to say that point is, if you want to work, that point only is at equal to one, and that point is at equal to minus one. Remember, set plus one is the root equal to zero, is at equal to minus one. That's the real part. Real is here. Real is there. Correct? This is complex conjugate. An important feature of the pole zero diagram is the unit circle. Pole zero diagram provides an insight into the properties of the discrete system. From the pole zero position, you can actually roughly sketch or infer the frequency response of the system, and that's the stage that you have to reach. You will reach that, no problem. By looking at the diagram, you will say, "Ah, oh, this is a low pass filter, or oh, this is a high pass filter." It's not going to come just overnight. It can take some few lectures to go through again and again to understand. Then also you can say by looking at the poles and zero, is it a stable system or unstable system? You can do that as well. We know for stability, or for a stable system, the poles must lie inside the unit circle. I, I 
mark the wrong line inside the hidden circle. The zero could be anywhere, the inside or outside, it doesn't contribute to stability at all. So if you have a transfer function, the zero does not contribute to stability, whereas poles contribute to stability. For a stable system, the poles must be inside the unit circle. The poles must be here. And the zeros, which you mark them as uh, with a with a road like that, or sorry, with a zero like that, they could be outside. Or they could be inside. Ha now you've been given a pole zero diagram. Here's a pole zero diagram given. And you have to write that transfer function, I think. How do you do that? Okay, let's have a look. What do you see here? You've got a zero there, you've got a zero here. That distance is one, that distance is minus one. But do you know that's a complex because there's two on the opposite direction in complex zero. Always in a transfer function there's a gain there. So what is this one? Is that minus J1 is that direction. This one is that plus J1. And this one then is, what is that value? That equal to 0 0.5 plus J0.5. Therefore, the first value is that minus 0 0.5 minus J0.5 equals 0. That's your one root. So that's what you get this one. And the second one, this one is that equal to 0 0.5 minus J0.5. So if you take it one side, 0 0.5 plus J0.5 equals 0. So that's this one. So you multiply these two, you get a second order system, you multiply that, you get a second order system. So from the pole zero, this is your transfer function. Now the question for you, is it a stable system or is it an un unstable system? Now, it is a stable system, but all the poles, all the poles are inside the unit circle. Unit circle, this is the unit circle inside, therefore it's a stable system. Zeros can be on the unit circle, this is on the unit circle, or inside the unit circle, or outside the unit circle. It doesn't matter. It does not contribute to the stability of the system, to the stability. Here's another example, pole zero plot. How do we plot this one? That equals zero. So here's the zero. This, a zero here, or pole at the origin, this is called the origin, does not contribute to the transfer function whatsoever. It's just sitting there to make the transfer function, um, uh, uh, it, to make it as a particular format. That means you can make as a delay or non-delay, the number of delays required. So by having a pole or zero at the origin does not do anything to a transfer function, apart from for make it simpler, uh, uh, the transfer function. In this case, that equal to A. And we are assuming, this is not unit, A is not equal to 1, therefore it could be any circle, right? But if you want to be stable, if, you, if this could be a stable one, A should be less than 1. So this pole should come inside and sit there, or up here. If you ever have a pole on this real axis, then they could be anywhere here, no problem. They will never cause any stability problem. If they go outside, it's unstable. If they go on the, on the circle, it will become unstable. But if you, if, you, if you want to have a pole here, then you must have a conjugate always, like in complex numbers. Here is another one. Determine, uh, uh, this is a hard one, but uh, if you didn't understand, that's okay. We will come back to this. Here is a difficult one. Here is a transfer function. Very difficult. So you expand that using, using any factorization principle, and then you've got one given here as well. What happened in this case is one of these, like we'll cancel out, this is a, we'll cancel out one of that. Because they are A, so one of the factors is going to be set minus A, so they will cancel out. That means, if this is 8, if you take this 8, set to the 8, right, minus, say, 1, for example. Right, if you say set to the minus, that's what I'm saying, A is 1, 
if, if you make a equal to 1 and m equal to 8, you will have a transfer function that is that is equal to, that will be 8 minus 1 divided by, uh, that will be, that will be 7 minus that minus 1. So if you factorize, you will get that minus 1 times that squared and so on. And divided by set minus 1 times set to the power of 7, this thing will cancel out. So without canceling, plus the, plus the zeros, 8 zeros will be there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There will be 8 zeros around the circle of A equal to 1 or A equal to A. And then what happens is, this is a pole that also has to be there. So this pole and this zero cancels out. Right. And then you've got zero set on that unit circle. So the, the system becomes a very stable system. It's, uh, it's called comb filter. I'll come back to this later. This is only illustration. If you didn't understand this part clearly, not to worry about it. This is set to the 7. Remember here? Set to the 8 or 9 or set to the 7. If you've got set to the 7, you've got 7 poles in there sitting at 0. I said eight poles there. If you've got seven poles sitting there, that's not going to do anything. They just don't do anything there at, at the origin. Here is another example of that. Now, this is a complex system I now have to analyze for you and to understand. This complex system, if you look at here, this system is, here is the pole, and this is your, your zero. So I can write this distance that R is to J theta. That's the, and this one as R is the minus J theta, because this angle is negative, that's positive. Like in complex number. So that's the force. And then I can say the zero is in here at the center. So that one is on zero. Using this, I can write the transfer function for this. When I write the transfer function, I will get an equation there. That's a zero. They are the pole. And if I now factorize them into first order partial fraction, and then if I find out the value of A and B, which you don't need to find, your transfer functions are simple enough, but you need to know this. If you do that, and then you write your transfer function, you divide by that, this becomes one minus, and take out one over J two sine theta out, and divide by that, you get that's the minus one, that's, that's the minus And now you go and do the inverse transfer function, you get inverse response HN. Now HN, if you look at it, if you, I'm just going to rush through this one because it's just a basic mathematics here. If you do the HN, you will find that's your inverse response. And you can, you can show, multiply the mean, this one will be a sine function because it's 2J, this divided by e to the j theta n minus e to the minus j theta n divided by 2j gives you sine n theta. And I'm left with then this r to the n minus 1 here because this r goes up there or cancel with one of them give you r to n minus 1. So I'm left with an equation of this. And what is this equation? Never mind about this part. It's only a scalar. If you look at this one, this equation looks like, to me, a sine wave, sine n theta, here. And if r is less than 1, it will multiply, so it will decay like that. So it's a decaying sine wave. So the impulse response of that particular system is like, like a sine wave here and then you decay that. So it will be decaying sine wave form. If you have got a decaying sine wave form like that, it's called a resonant system, which means the band pass filter. Again, we will touch upon this later on. So the resonant will come in when only you have a complex force, which is what you had. Which is what you had, a complex force. If you have a complex pole, we have got a resonance system. 
What does that mean? It's a decaying sine wave from one particular frequency. This is called theta, it's called the frequency of oscillation. So for various branches of R, let's look at that waveform. Here is my pole inside the unit circle. Here is my sine wave, you know, but because of R is less than 1, it decays away. Here is my pole, R is 1 now. So when I have R1, if I have R1, that's 1, I only have sine and theta. So you get a nice sine waveform. It does not decay at all. And when R is greater than 1, you can see the poles are outside the unit circle when I have that. If the decay sine wave increases exponentially, it's an unstable system. And you can actually learn from here, if you have one real pole inside the unit circle, only one real pole, that is H that is equal to that over 1 minus, um, say, 0 0.6, for example. That's here. This is 1. This is 0. This is 0 0.6. This is minus 1. This is minus 0 0.6. We have something like that. You can show that its response is like decaying like this. You can take the inverse tran transform HM. That will tell you this is how it looks like. So overall, what I have shown you, complex roots give you damned sine waveform. That means their frequency response look resonant. Next slide shows that for you. Here is an example of a of a of a second order resonant system, complex poles. Here is a second order system. You see the system? You can write the transfer function for this. I've been told it's a complex pole, so I draw, I write the complex pole here. And I've been told this is the frequency at which it's going to resonate. So I write this equation, because R is the J theta, and that's that one, you all know that. From this, I get this one. So R, okay, sorry, that's okay. Now if I just write these two, and I leave that as for the moment, look at my diagram here. I write the transfer function. There is no numerator, only feedback system. So H is equal to 1 over. This minus will give you plus here. That to the minus 1, that to the minus 2. Right? This should, this should, this is not the right. This should be taken from here. That's it. And this shouldn't be right either. This should be taken from here. Right? So this is your transfer function. And this is your transfer function for this system. This is system A. I'm going to write the transfer function for that, and I'm going to equate them then. So I draw the transfer function for the for my filter, and then I, I wrote the transfer function from the unit circle. See that? And then I combine this one, multiply them out. I've done this before. I get this. I can now equate these two. I equate. I will equate these two. When I equate that, I get the B1 equal to 2R cos theta naught, B2 equal to R squared, cos theta naught is this, and theta naught is this. Theta naught is the resonant frequency. Theta naught becomes the resonant frequency. So let's look at the graph, and I'm going to vary the value of B, like the B1 and B2. And I'm going to plot a graph for you. So I'm changing B1 is that, 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 that. B2 is R squared. I've got that. R is that. I mean, B2 is R means how far your poles are. That's your R. And you cannot be outside the unit circle. It has to be inside. And I work this out and do a plot graph. And I find that by varying, uh, and my R and the position, now my, my position was, I set this to at that point. That's theta, theta known, which is pi over 4, I have. So pi over 4 is that position. That's the resonant position. If the R is inside, if the R is small, I don't get that much of resonance. If my R is, is large, I get very high peak. You can go back and see that. R is large means what? 
all is lost. It's going towards the new circuit because after that it's unstable. So R can be maximum by 0 0.99999. R cannot be 1. If it is 1, it's on the unit circuit. And if you have 0 0.999, it will go peaking. And if you have 0, R is 1, it's an unstable. When you are plotting the magnetical response, you will find, which again later on you will find, the right hand side plot is exactly the same as the left hand side plot. So you don't need to plot the left hand side all the time. You can just divide with the right hand side. Okay? I have simulated this in MATLAB, I think. And this is how the graph you get. Each graph I plotted there in MATLAB. And you can see it's resonating. Resonating means it's going to peak. So now you can say, right here you go. You have got x hat equal to 1 over 1 minus 0 0.6 at the minus 1. If you ask me to draw the graph, I will say amplitude, it is no reason at all, a first order system, that's a pi, a first order system, order of 1, will never resonate. Now I have got a transfer function x hat is equal to 1 over 1 minus 0 0.1 that is the minus 1 plus. 0.4 to the minus 2. I don't know what the resonance frequency is. Say resonance frequency, you can calculate. You know, the equation was there, cos theta naught. Calculate and you get, say, pi over 4. So this means my graph at pi over 4 is here. At pi over 4, it's going to peak. So it's going to go and peak up at pi over 4 and come down. That means the resonance system. That means this must have complex rules. A second order system is the only system it can resonate. It can have fourth order system resonating, but basically second order system can provide resonance. If the second order hasn't got a complex rules, then what will happen is this is your first order, the second order will go as the same thing and bit it's it's cheaper. Because no complex root, no resonance. If you have got a complex root, then it'll go like that. No complex root, it will go like this. Go like that. Okay? So that's how the system works in, in. Here is another uh, concept that you have to learn. And you are going to find this chapter has a lot of things in it. Take it take it slowly. Understand slowly. And then at the end of the chapter, do the problems, and you'll have got a better understanding. Okay. Chapter 1, part A. Chapter 2, part A. Chapter 1, uh, part B. All those three have linked together. So you really start to really look at slowly and go through them. Okay. Once you have listened to it, I mean, this CD is only two-hour lecture. So basically, two-hour lecture, you should be able to go through them within two to four hours. You should be able to understand reasonably understand, or you might have to put a bit more time. Okay, let's, I'm now going to another thing, I'm going to sketch a magnitude response of a system from the transfer function. Can I do that? Well, again, it's possible. Here is the system, I've given the zero, here I'm looking at it, I know it's complex, so it's going to be resonant, I know. Where it's going to resonate? At theta, which is pi over 4. So I know this system has got minus 1, this is 0. 0 means, and the magnitude response, it will go to 0. That's exactly what happened. So let's plot the graph, the next magnitude response. You can see here, I plotted the, um, the, the poles. One is here, one is complex conjugate, that's pi over 4. And I know at, it is got that equal to minus 1, there's a 0. 0 means at theta equal to pi, it has got a zero. So in my in my magnitude response, I come in and say there is a zero at pi. So I must have a zero at that point. It must go to zero. I don't know where at this point. T pi to zero. I don't know what value. So it could be here. Never mind the other side. This side is symmetrical always when you do magnitude response. I know it has got a complex root at pi over four. Then it has to peak at pi over four. I should have a peak like that. So it will be the graph like that and then that. Now to make this graph different, 
I could now say, here you are frequency response, and exactly same thing, same pi over 4, pi over 4, and I could say now, well, here is a 0, here is a 0. Draw your graph. Then you come in and you say, right, at pi and 0, at 0, that's t that equal to 0, that's t that equal to pi, there's two zeros there. So at 0, it has to be 0, at pi also there has to be 0. The magnitude has to come to 0 if there's a 0 there. At pi over 4, it was like this, pi over 4, it has to peak. So the graph should go like that and come down. There is some mismatch So it's kind of a band pass filter. And here is also a band pass filter, but it's not truly here. And you should bring it down here. If, you want. if I want to bring this down to that point, I must put a zero. So in my transfer function, I need to go back and say, what do I have to do? I say here, I say multiply by one minus and zero minus one. So as I do that, I've got a zero at set equal to one, zero at set equal to minus one. That's how you do it. Okay? Here's another example. Oh, it's the same example I had. But I got a zero here and here, but the resonant frequency here, complex conjugate, is occurring at pi over two. That's pi over two. So I got a zero there, fine. I got a zero at pi according to this. And then I got a resonant at pi over two. I go pi over two and find there I just put a peak there. Now you will find if this moves away, what will happen? This will get sharper like that. It moves in, if it that moves in, if that moves in to point 0.5, and this will go broader like that. This is bigger, broader. Bandwidth is broader, bandwidth is narrower. See? That's how, that's how you design your bandpass filters. Now, this is, here's another example here, and if you look at this example, there's no zeros here. There's nothing, nothing. The zeros are here and here, and at the same position, you've got pole plus one, pole by inside. So, definitely, the magnitude is going to be starting from there. Never mind about this side. It's going to go to a zero at pi over two, so you go here, pi over two. And this is trying to resonate. So really, these two trying to give you a graph of like, like that, correct? Kind of, kind of like that. And this zero is trying to give a graph of like that. And these two compromises, and what happens is, these two will then broaden like that, and this cancel out with that, they come at that point as all zone. I don't know, you, you have understood that? All I'm saying is that if you draw individually, let's do individually, okay? Here is my graph for my poles that I'm going to draw. They are pi over 2, pi is here, pi over 2 is here, and I'm just going to draw pi over 2. It's going to go peak there, and it's going to come down like that. And then I'm going to draw my, my zero position. My zeros are at pi over 2 again. So if you come there, zero definitely be sharper and come there, because when you be zero there, then come on like that. Now if I combine these two, if I combine these two, this is trying to pull up, this is trying to pull down, so that the net effect will be, this will pull, pull down, it will broaden like that, and this one will cancel out with that, so at that point it will plateau. Like that. So that's what you have here. Roughly. This is a rough sketch. So you need to have that kind of a knowledge and understanding of how to do it. Once you do a few of those, it's a lot easier. Very easy. But don't forget, next Monday class, just come in and ask me on these. Again, if you want on a discussion, I can help you. So, what is in summary? That's how we come to the end. 
Oh my goodness, it's two and a half hours of lecture I'm giving to no students in front of me and assuming in my mind that there are students standing in front of me and giving this lecture. So I hope that you've understood and if there's things that you don't understand, you can come and ask me in the discussion class. Now, the last part that we have is summary of the chapter. What are you expected to know at the end of the chapter? First thing is properties of that transform and the application. You know that, I've done that. This is convolution, time and set domain. Time domain we have done before, set domain we have done here, and you need to combine and understand. How to find an inverse set transform of a transfer function, we have done that. What is the difference between a set transform and a trans uh, a plus transform? When to use when to use them. Like you know that when to use them and you know the relationship. Estimation of frequency response of a transfer function. Just from transfer functions substituting set equal to set equal to e to j theta, right? And hand calculate magnitude and phase response of a simple transfer function. So phase we can leave it out because we are not doing it here, just magnitude response. By looking at it you should be able to grow. And then Four zero description of a system you are given. You need to know how to do a four zero description and four zero diagram of a transfer function and how to derive resonance frequency equation on a second order system. I have shown you a second order system and calculate cos theta is to a resonance frequency which is I think minus V1 over V2 I think. Just check this one and, and how to do that. All these calculations that you need to know, everything that I've done is in the in the lecture notes without without any problem. Okay, that's the that's the end of the chapter. But what I'm going to do is, uh, which I wasn't planning before, but I put few questions behind this, and I'm going to run through the solutions for you. Okay, and see whether you understood. These questions are already in your, in your lecture notes uh, as part of the quiz. So, here's the question. You have been given this structure, it is a digital system or digital filter. You have been asked to do the transfer function. Now, the first question is, how do we do this transfer function? There's many ways. You can write equations. The easiest way, I would say, is that look at the four feet forward part. And if you look at the feed forward path, you have got A naught goes directly, and A naught also goes here, but it's going to be delayed one, twice. So by the time it comes in here, it's going to be A naught set to the minus two. A naught set to the minus two. There's nothing here connecting it, so we don't need to worry about it. This A naught goes directly. So immediately I can say H set is equal to on the top, remember, I did this one before. On the top, I say A naught goes directly. So I said A naught x. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. A naught is the first one. Then I can say plus A naught. This A naught is going to go set to the minus one, set to the minus one, set to the minus two. And then this part is the feedback part. And your B two, whatever coming here, is going to go through two delays. Whatever comes here is going to go one delay. So we have one. If it's minus B1, we should have a plus B1 set to the minus 1. If we have the B2, it should be minus B2 and go twice, so set to the minus 2. That is your transfer function. That's how you write it. You don't need to write any of the equation. By looking at it, you should do it. And I think if you check this one, and... Um, I should be okay, but this answer is wrong. It can't be set to the minus one because it's going through one, two delay, so it should be set to the minus two. And uh, this one is correct. B set one, and you can see the signs are right as well. So that is how you do this question. Redo it again. Look at your notes and redo this question again yourself and see whether you get the signs and things right. If you would have had uh, something here, like A1, what would have happened? Tell me. What will happen is, this A1 takes the X set here, X set comes to the A1, has to go through one delay. So you will have here, A1, that is a minus 1, added to it. That's all the difference is. If you did not have this part, for example, this part was out, what will happen? 
in your equation, that will disappear. Okay? So you can simply use in this example alone, you can do so many things. Here's another example. I have got two zeros and two fours. I have already done this ex exercise earlier. So I'm just redoing it again. These are complex poles. So complex poles at whatever other frequency you give like that. These are complex zeros because complex they are on the same line and also at S at pi over two. And complex zero is going to give you something like sharp here and go like that. And when you combine all these both of them, it's going to be this is going to be broaden and it's going to go and these two cancel out so you just that. That's your overall response. And that's what you have. That will happen at pi over two. You should have, by giving this, you should be able to draw all these. Here is another example of how to calculate the magnitude response. In terms of the magnitude response. Remember, we learned earlier magnitude response. If you have got H stat, what do you do? You substitute H stat equal to that to the minus, that equal to E to the J T So this is your, uh, yes, so I'm doing slightly different method and, and uh, is, 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 this is not, I, this is here for some reason, six to the six to the I can actually calculate magnitude response by substituting yes. that, definitely. So I substitute that, take it up became that one. And I can take complex, uh, um, do the real part and manually part. Or another way, which uh, you can learn now or later on, is find out the complex conjugate of that. That means, if you want to find out the complex conjugate after you substitute such equal to e to the g theta in the equation, you change this minus sign to plus sign. They won't change. Now, if you multiply this one and this one, we can show it will be more h theta squared. Do you want to know how? Well, let me try it. Let me try this one. How is it going to work out? Let's say I have got a complex number um, h H, uh, H, 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 H sat, which is A plus J B. Then I take the conjugate of that, which becomes A minus J B. If I now multiply H sat, multiply by H sat conjugate, I will get A squared plus B squared. And what is the modulus value in that? Mod H sat is square root of h squared plus e squared. So, h sat squared is equal to a squared plus e squared. So that's what I'm getting. So, if I multiply these two, I get h sat squared or h theta squared. So, you can actually use this technique in order to calculate the frequency response. Right. So, I calculated this. I calculated this. And then I multiply those two, I get modulus h theta squared. So I just now do the multiplication, and I find that one cancel out that, and it's equal to 1. What does that mean? My magnitude response is flat. It doesn't attenuate anything. That means it's called an all path filter. That's the name. This is one way of calculating the frequency response. It's good to know this method, and because it's easy for you to calculate magnitude response using this method. Uh, another structure here. Here is a digital filter, and you have been asked to draw the structure. All you see in front is a constant here. If you have got a transfer function, the constant does do nothing apart from its constant the input or it's the output. I can draw this as my forward path. I can draw this as my backward path. And if I do that, what I have is, here is my excess. This is my constant C. And then I have got this post here directly. And then I delay this one, such as minus one. And then C here, and goes here. And that one then goes back, and plus, and this is my Y z. And this is my delay, 
and then this is my A and there. That is my system, correct system. But remember, I did in chapter 2, you can actually switch the system around. This one, it can be switched around. When you switch it around, these two delay become as a common delay. When you put the common delay together, when you switch around, this A comes here, and the B comes here, this is the B, and this becomes as a canonic structure. Canonic structure is what I've asked for it. Canonic means minimum number of delays. Here you've got two delays. Here it's got one delay. So this structure is fine unless you've been asked to draw canonic structure. You can leave it like that. And if you're not sure about canonic, just again ask the tutor or ask me again in the class. But this question, I'm going to leave you to draw a sketch and see. I've already done a similar one before, so you can do this, right? And then the last one here is the last diagram. Approximate response. All you have to do is then four at pi over four. How do you know pi over four? If you write the form, it is equal zero point five d zero point five. So can be done. Equal to 0.5 divided by 0.5, so theta is equal to 45 degrees, and inverse. So it's pi over 4 here, and there's a 0 at the DC point, theta and equal to north, so there's a 0, so it goes peak and then down there. That's the approximate, approximate magnitude response. Um, this is another example where uh, uh, the equation is here, so it's last two examples. Here's a different equation. You've been asked to find the transfer function. So you said y z equal to x z minus x z set to the minus 8 minus y z set to the minus 2. So that's the equation here. You arrange them the way you want it and get that as your transfer function. Okay, so these are just one or two examples for you to try out, and then you come in the, possibly the last example, which I've done earlier, first order digital with the transfer function given, you have to find the impulse response. So to do impulse response, remember I told you to break it up for partial fraction. Here you can group them together, and if you break it up that way, you get one part, and then you break this one, you divide them individually, you get second part. Then look at the inverse transform. This will be a to the n u n, fine. And there's a small trick here. Here also is a to the n u n, but because you put a delay on the top, it will become as a to the n minus one u n minus one. Okay, remember that. So if you had a delay that minus two here, this will become a to the n minus two u n minus two. That's where I inverse the transform. Is this stable, system stable? Yes, of course. If A is less than 1, and you can plot it, or you can look at it. If A is less than 1, we have looked at before, the output will be decay like that. If the output decays, then it's a stable system. Well, that's the end of this chapter. I have given you a lot of examples, and I've got, so I'll ask you to go through them again and again until you understand the principle, then you can try your tutorial questions. Okay? Thank you. <coughs>